the Mandalay Lusho Express. For over a century, trains have been plying this popular route into northern Myanmar. The railway links the hot lowland plains with the green hills of the northeastern Shan state. The trip across the Goktak viaduct is still an experience today. The train has to slow to a walking pace as it passes over the aging steel construction. Myanmar's past and future come together here along the railway line. Almost 250 meters high and nearly 700 meters long, this bridge was once the longest in the British Empire. Built to traverse a deep ravine, it's still considered a masterpiece of engineering today. Until just a few years ago, Photographing this strategically important bridge was strictly prohibited. Even today, there are minefields surrounding the towers at the base of the bridge to secure it against rebels in the north who are still fighting against the central government. Myanmar is a country in transition. More and more people now own a car, but the train is still a quicker way to reach the other side of the valley. Train driver Yuzo Win has been working this route for 20 years. The first time I took this train over the bridge, I wasn't the driver, I was just an assistant. But today I know every inch of the track and all the challenges the route presents. I was a bit nervous to start with, but now I have more confidence in the design and structure. After a short break, the train continues on its journey north. Myanmar is made up of states or administrative divisions. Shan State, through which the old railway passes, is in the northeast of the country. The city of Mandalay, which is the starting point of the journey, is an important religious and economic center in Myanmar. Before it was annexed by the British in 1885, this city on the Irrawaddy River was the last royal capital of the Burmese kingdom. Buddha himself is said to have once visited Mandalay Hill. Countless monks have since followed in his footsteps. Ukaila is one of them. Buddha once predicted that a major city would be built at the foot of this hill. And so it was. A statue of Buddha is kept in a pagoda at the foot of the hill.
On nights with a full moon, a special ceremony is held for Myanmar's most sacred Buddha statue. The Mahamuni Buddha is said to be one of only five statues that were produced during Buddha's lifetime and was consecrated by him personally. During the ceremony, the most senior monk at the temple washes the statue. It is very moving for me to be able to watch this sacred ceremony. The train sets out from Mandalay every morning at 4 a.m. to begin its journey north. Sleeping on the platform is one way of ensuring you don't miss the train. Ukaila is also taking the train north. Driver Yu So Win usually turns up just a few minutes before the train is due to leave. It's one thing to drive in a straight line across the plains, but quite another to maneuver through the mountains. Particularly when you're entering the mountains, that part's not so easy. He first has to drive 50 kilometers across lowlands before he reaches the Shan Mountains. Those 50 kilometers take nearly two hours. Taking the train in Myanmar is a tutorial in slowing down. The stops at the stations are unhurried. Even the driver has enough time for a bowl of soup and a coffee. He now embarks on the most difficult part of the journey. Yusor Wynn radios to his colleagues at the next station to let them know he's on his way. To reach the Shan Plateau, the train has to climb nearly 900 meters in altitude. The points or switches on the railway track need to be adjusted accordingly. His colleagues radio back to say they're now ready to go and ask how long he'll be. About 10 minutes, he says. To get to the top, the train passes through a system of switches that allow it to go back and forth. It's a bit like climbing steps.
train stops at the end of a set of tracks. The driver then waits until the points behind him have been switched over to another set. By hand, of course. Once the switches have been changed, the driver gets the go-ahead and drives in reverse to the end point, one level higher. This maneuver is repeated several times. The train is now 400 meters higher than it was when it began the ascent, although it's only covered a short distance. After moving up in four stages, the train is now at the right level for the mountain plateau. Monk Ukala prefers traveling by train to driving in a car. I go to Mandalay about twice a month to fulfill my religious duties. In the train I have peace and quiet. It's not a mad rush like on the roads. At his next stop, he gets off the train and continues his journey home on foot. Outside the village, the locals built a small monastery where five monks spend their time praying and meditating. The people of the village also provide for the monks. At the top of the hill, there's a temple. The villagers see the building of the pagoda and the presence of the monks as a spiritual investment or good karma. Many hope that as a result, they'll be elevated to a higher level in the next life. On returning home, the monk immediately pays homage to Buddha. By striking the bell, I'm sharing my good deeds and my love with the world. Ringing the bell three times means you have done something good. The town of Pienulwin, some 30 kilometers further north, was once the summer capital of the British colonial administration. The British chose this area because the climate is mild throughout the year. 
while the summer heat in Mandalay can be unbearable, here in the Shan Hills, temperatures are more like in Central Europe. Today, the town is a melting pot of different religions and ethnic groups. Pienulwin has the largest military base in northern Myanmar and is also a significant market town. The railway operates a repair workshop here for the aging trains. Rail inspector Ko Nang oversees the work. Every morning, Kota Nang receives his schedule for the day. Today, he has to check the hydraulics on the brakes. In this mountainous region, properly functioning brakes are particularly essential. The braking system is kaput. We have to repair it before the train can continue. I can't say how long it will take. For travelers in Myanmar, delays are nothing unusual. As practically everything here is mechanical, all repairs can at least be done on the spot. You can tighten it again, he says. They've soon solved the problem. Compressed air is then fed into the hydraulics. Kota Nang does a sound test. With experience, you learn to hear the different sounds the hammer makes when the brake discs and hydraulics are working properly. The market in Pienu Luin is the largest trading center for fruit and vegetables in the whole of Shan State. Trader Dordi has been in the business for 35 years. She knows she can make good money by selling this produce in the small villages further north. I find out what the prices are beforehand and then order everything. After that, I buy only a few additional items. The town of Pyunulwin is well known for its horse-drawn carriages, which, up until a few years ago, was still the main form of transport. But since Myanmar has opened up to the rest of the world and cars can now be imported, the carriages have increasingly become a nostalgic relic of a time when Myanmar was almost completely cut off from the outside world. It's now eight o'clock in the morning. The train from Mandalay is due in half an hour. 67-year-old Dordi will make the journey by train, as she's done for 35 years. Road transport is all very well, but old habits die hard. Besides, she can sell some of her goods on the way. Fried noodles and papaya salad, she announces to the passengers as the train pulls in. Some carriages are set aside solely for freight. But the rest of the train becomes a traveling bazaar with passengers buying and selling their goods. As soon as the train leaves, the village goes back to normal life. Everyone here knows trains only come through twice a day. <laughs> okay. 
Before leaving Pino Luin, sand is poured into the front of the train, which then trickles out onto the tracks ahead, allowing the wheels of the train to have better grip on the mountain tracks. The mountainous landscape of Shan State is known as the breadbasket of Myanmar. Everything grows here, from tomatoes to corn to strawberries. I like the train. We used to be packed in here like sardines. But many traders now have their own car. So that makes it easier to get a seat. It's also cheaper to use the train. After about four hours, the train reaches Nongchuo. Women selling snacks and refreshments get on board. Dohla is one of them. It's midday and many passengers are ready for lunch. Once on the train, she makes her way through the aisles, shouting out what she has to offer. Biscuits, salad, nuts, water and beer. Other sellers are doing the same. After about half an hour, the initial rush is over. Just in time to enjoy the view of the Goktag viaduct. The bridge is also popular with Burmese tourists. The railway was built in the late 19th century to transport silver from the mines in the north to the city of Mandalay. When it was completed, the Goktaik Viaduct was the second longest railway bridge in the world. Dohla now has a chance to relax. Today she's listening to monks chanting, thanks to an MP3 file on her phone. My working day is quite strenuous and starts early. Meditation helps me unwind. I find the monk's voice and the message of Buddha more relaxing than anything else. In Nonpeng, the train heading back in the other direction is already waiting. When both trains are on time, they meet here, just after the bridge. The women selling refreshments now change trains to begin a second sales tour on the return trip home. Meanwhile, the train going north is ready to continue. Dordi is now nearing her destination, the town of Kyokmai. Dordi's grandson is already waiting. He's paid two other men to help carry the goods. They transport the produce to markets in the surrounding villages. Put the baskets of tomatoes in the pickup back there. 
Oh, these still look quite green. Dordie is an affluent woman who certainly doesn't need to work anymore. She's 67, but has no plans to retire. <laughs> Meanwhile, railway inspector Ko Neng has been charged with checking repairs made to the track bed. The old railway sleepers made of teakwood are rotten and need to be replaced with concrete ones. A separate wagon takes Kota Nang to the repair site, north of the Goktak Bridge. The teams of workers begin their shift as soon as the morning train has passed and work until the afternoon. The extremely heavy sleepers, or ties, are all replaced by manual labor. Kota Nang supervises. That one needs to be a bit closer. Easy, easy. As soon as the new railway ties are in place, a wagon is driven over them to test that they're firmly in place. All good. The workers are finished for the day. The wagon then takes them back home. Once the working day is over, many Burmese like to enjoy a beetle quid. The beetle leaf is coated with lime, which releases the alkaloid content in the nut that is placed inside. The whole thing is rolled up and placed in the side of the mouth or chewed. It's a mild drug and stains the teeth red, but it can also cause oral cancer. Chewing beetle leaves is still a part of everyday life for many in Myanmar. The valley beneath the Goktak Bridge is now in sight as the workers return home. Keeping the old railway running smoothly is a major operation. There's about 150 of us working constantly on the railroad. The sleepers, the track and smaller overpasses all have to be constantly maintained or replaced. 
and the big bridge here has to be repainted every three years. Myanmar Railways is a state-owned agency. Most of the workers live right by the station in low-cost housing, reserved especially for railway employees. It's now a new day. The train inspector and his family also live here. Kota Nang has the day off. He's getting his seven-year-old son, Yimin Ong, ready for school. Kota Nang works shifts. I've been working for the railway since 1987. I've had various jobs and I've been living here for five years. I only find out each morning where I'm going to be working, where on the line I'm needed. On his days off, Kotenang takes his son to school himself. Doing good is a daily duty for all practicing Buddhists. Every morning, a monk comes by their house. So Kota Neng's wife, Ma Win, gives him a portion of rice. But she also gets something in return. Those who feed the monks are rewarded with a prayer. Kota Nang has now arrived at the school with his son. Education is rated very highly among Myanmar's up-and-coming middle class. Many parents dream of a better future for their children in a country that is opening up increasingly to the rest of the world. State schools are big on punctuality. All students have to attend the morning roll call. Anyone arriving late might even be barred from lessons the whole day. Every morning, the students listen to the national anthem. Houses are a favorite meeting place for men in Myanmar. 37-year-old Tun Tun Oo also works on the trains, selling a kind of herbal medicine to passengers. He's going to teach his brother how to make it. I want my younger brother to help me, and it's good to pass on our family's knowledge to him. So now I'm going to show him which plants I use to make our herbal tincture. The brothers go out into the wild to collect the plants. They head to the jungle outside the town of Nankyo, where they can get the key ingredients for their herbal tincture. The most important component is the root of the camphor tree. The essential oils in the root are said to aid blood circulation. They're also helpful for people with bronchial problems. You need to dig for it right at the base, Tonton O explains. Okay. 
He's careful not to damage the roots so badly that the tree dies. He needs the trees to keep growing so that he can keep harvesting the root. This is the first time that I've come to the forest with my brother. I want to learn everything I can about the plants and what they're good for. In a forest clearing, they find another plant that they can use in their herbal tincture. The younger brother notes that it smells of mint. This plant from the verbena family can be used in its entirety, so Tuntun Or rips the whole thing out by its roots. The brothers then return to Nang Kyo. Next, they cut up the plants they've collected and leave them to dry in the sun for several days. Only then are they ready to be processed. The dried plant pieces are placed in recycled bottles and filled up with a high-proof distilled rice liquor. The tincture is now almost ready. The whole thing now has to sit for five days. Then it can work miracles. The tincture is good for muscle pains, back pain, tension, and even colds. You can keep topping it up with alcohol as long as the liquid turns red again afterwards. Back in Pienulwin, all goes quiet once the evening train leaves for Mandalay. Train inspector Kota Neng has decided to surprise his wife and son by taking them for a professional family photo. Such photos are typically taken in front of beautiful green landscapes or luxurious villas. And at 10 euros a pop, it's not cheap by Burmese standards. Okay, Ready? You know, one, two, three. So now give your mother a kiss. And now your father. Ready? One, two, three. We want to give our son happy memories he can keep, so we often come to the photographer, and always on special occasions. The next morning, just as the bell chimes, Dor La is back at the station in Nong Kyu, ready for another day's work selling refreshments. Her homemade specialty is popular. Tea leaf salad and quail's eggs, a typical Burmese breakfast. As the train pulls in, she hastily packs up her basket. The two brothers who make the herbal tincture are also here. The younger one is joining his brother to sell their products on the train.
Like every morning, the train moves off towards the Goktak Bridge and the vendors get to work. Tea leaf salad, cookies, beer, drinks. Train inspector Kota Neng has spent the last two days working on other sections of the track. Today he wants to surprise his wife by bringing home the family photo. What will she say? Hey, have a look at this. It's great, isn't it? What do you think? Oh, I'm very pleased. It's a really beautiful keepsake. Myanmar, a country on the move. <laughs>